You're welcome back. It's time now to go and see what we can lift off the press uh, by looking at what made it to the front pages of some of our national dailies this morning. And to do that with us, we have standing by uh, Mr. Tunde Kolaoli, a legal practitioner uh, who will be talking with us from Lagos State here. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Kolaoli. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay, it's a wonderful day. On one hand, uh, the, the transportation of Lagosians will, will be cut in half uh, by the pronouncement of the governor. And on the other hand, Labour is insisting they are going on strike. <laughs> Let's begin with that, which is not even uh, on the press. Uh, All right. So, now, let's go to Punch newspaper. Since um, it's the first newspaper before us uh, this morning, Punch newspaper has that story that I just uh, alluded to now. Subsidy uh, talks, Labour shuns federal government begins protests as oil workers down stool. The protest will happen. Uh, I hear that the federal government had a meeting with Labour leaders and all that. I expected that there would be a pronouncement this morning that, okay, the strike has been called off because we have reached an agreement and... X, Y, Z is going to be done, but the strike is going on. Let me have your comments on what you feel about this. You know, the writers are how federal government NLC meeting ended in deadlock, Labour, PDP, um, berates Tinubu's proposal of proposed pay rise. That's one of the things. And IG orders AIG CPs to maintain order, prevent violence. Falano says protest is lawful. Remember that um, the Inspector General said um, no violent protest is allowed in Nigeria. But the NLC is not talking about a violent protest. They're talking about a peaceful protest and all that. So let me just have your comments on that headline. Uh, let, let me quickly say that uh, all over the world, hmm, protest has become an I mean, an illegal right. It is the right of a citizen. When you also go into the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, then I will see the protest is um, allowed. Furthermore, it is also the right of workers to withdraw their services when they feel displeased with either the working conditions or the policies of government and the company institutions in which uh, they work. The other alternative is uh, to go to court and to civilize people to vet your anger and seek a redress. Of course, people can also write petitions and letters to people who are in charge of their fear to seek a redress. So if the Nigerian Labour Congress, having had a series of meetings with the federal government, if Labour at the state level have had meetings with the state government that has not yielded any productive results, I should think the next medical step, the next medical steps to take is to embark on a strike to vent their anger. So what the labor is doing today is supported by law, is supported by international convention, and it is an inalienable uh, uh, right. And you see why this strike is very, very important. You will see that uh, even though Mr. President said that since he removed the stress of today, they've been able to save about uh, one trillion naira which is uh, good for the president and good for the country. But on the other hand, we also find that the National Assembly, immediately they resumed, the first thing they did was to allocate 70 billion to themselves. So the implication of this is this. If care is not taken, whatever monies are saved from this petroleum subsidy, we still go like uh, it happened during the passenger's era, in which money was saved, and then the politicians have uh, it. 
Furthermore, it would have been better for the new government to put a palliative in place before embarking on the removal of stress subsidy. The removal of subsidy without the palliative in, in place is like putting the cart before the horse, which doesn't go well for anybody. We have all seen the implication. Prices have skyrocketed. Inflation is uh, way, way up there. Cost of transportation is very high now. In fact, the economy could be said to have been shut down with the removal of this uh, subsidy uh, thing. So, if I were the president, I would begin to work hard on the regime of policies that they said they want to put in place in the area of agriculture, in the area of transportation, in the area of increases in wages, remuneration, and allowances, and also look at ways and means to ensure that the Naira gets stronger vis-à-vis -vis other foreign currencies. Because if the Naira remains at the same level in which it is today, it will be difficult to bring down inflation. It will also be difficult to cut down on prices of goods and services. Because we don't produce anything here. 90% of what we consume is imported from abroad. Even including agricultural products. Rice, beans, palm oil, vegetable oil and whatever. Baby milk and cereal. They are all imported from abroad. So if the Naira is not performing well against other foreign currency, it will be difficult to cut down the prices of goods and services in the society. Then the number of vehicles that the government said they will put on road to alleviate the transportation problem of citizens is neither here nor there. I think they are talking about maybe 30,000 uh, vehicles or thereabouts. In a country of 200 million people with this very large expanse of land, that is like a drop in the ocean. It will not meet the requirements of alleviating the sufferings of our people in any way. So that's my take. Okay, my worry, uh, two things that are w giving me some worry, is that we still have the no work, no pay thing that I don't see really as a good thing. But there's the no work, no pay, even though in the Constitution it is a right for people to protest. And if you're protesting, you can't be in the office and protest. You'll be on the streets. There is that. And the second thing worrying me is the fact that in Nigeria, when you have a protest, uh, the correct thing to do is meet the police and say, okay, we want to protest, give us protection. But the first thing that comes out of, of the police is a warning. We do not tolerate protest, whether you're calling it a violent protest or anything. We do not tolerate protest. We are against it and all that. And so the people who are going to protest already know that they are on their own. So that even if you finally give them one or two police officers that will go and be with them while they're protesting, everybody knows that your heart is not in it. So the no work, no pay in, on the one hand, the fact that you may not even be pro protected as a protester is on the other hand. And I'm sure that some people that will go for the protest may even carry some things to protect themselves should any uh, problem break out during this protest. So how do we... How do we have a constitution granting protest to people and then still have a no work, no pay? And then how do we also have the right of the people, uh, sh which should be protected by the police, and having the police always warn us against protest? I don't understand. Well, let me quickly say that uh, I have participated in so many protests and rallies in my life. Right from secondary school to university, and to when uh, I became a worker in Nigeria. In my experience, most of the time when labor, for example, and even the students are protesting, they don't engage in any violence. They only do that. What usually happens is that the Nigerian state, the government, 
Most times, we send wood drums to attack the workers who are protesting. They will send wood drums to attack the students who are protesting. They will send the written provocateurs, including security men, to attack those who are protesting. So as to be able to break uh, uh, the posters and give it a bad name. Simply because those governments all over the world are never comfortable with the process. Cast your mind back to what happened during the uprising against the Nigerian police, which has been dubbed as a kind of end, end, end path. The children, our children were very peaceful. They conducted themselves in a very civilized manner, not the places that we were protesting. They wake up in the morning, clean up the protest ground, organize food, bring in musicians in there to play, and then bring in people to come and talk to them and address them. They even welcome government officials who are eager to talk to them. I remember the governor Shawolu went to the Lekito gate to address the protesters and what happened. It was the Nigerian state that introduced violence, or who always introduced violence into some of these things. And what is coming from the mouth of the IG is very, very unfortunate, totally unfortunate. The police are supposed to protect protection for whoever is protesting in Nigeria and to make sure that the protest is never attacked by either hoodlums or whoever may want to take advantage. And why would people want to take advantage? A lot of people are jobless. A lot of people are hungry. A lot of people are very angry with the Nigerian state. So when there's any disturbance, when there's an opportunity of protest, they want to use to vent their anger on the state, on the Nigerian government, on the politicians, on the rich people in the society that they think are responsible for their plight. To avoid this kind of a situation, the police, the DSL, the civil defense, Lagos neighborhood security work, last month immigration and other civil defense corps to provide adequate protection to whoever they want to protest and even guide them. Follow them through whatever channels they want to pass through and make sure that the protest is never exact. Nigeria should behave like all civilized societies. We had protests in France recently, just a few weeks ago. Nobody was killed, nobody was attacked, even though the attack was used. But not a single person lost their life in all the protests that have taken place in France in the last six months. And they were mammoth and very massive uh, protests. That is the direction in which we should go. And not for the idea of police to start uh, threatening uh, protesters uh, uh, that people will be dealt with if they dare to protest. Okay. Uh, we may need to come back to the punch because uh, there are some headlines there that we might need to treat as well. But um, uh, let's, let's go to the Guardian right now, the Guardian newspaper. Uh, there are some headlines there that... Uh, would want to just look at. From the southeast, sit at home and force us killed 250 people in two years. That is what the Ohane Zendibo is saying. This sit at home thing. Um, the other time, just a few days ago, the leader of the proscribed uh, indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, wrote a letter to the supposed disciple, his supposed disciple staying elsewhere uh, not in Africa even, uh, Simon Ekpa, and said that the sit at home should stop because it is, it is rather killing the people of the Southeast. It is killing their businesses and it is not doing any good to that um, uh, section of our country. And Simon, Simon Ekpa said he doesn't believe that letter comes from Namdi Kanu and he will continue. In fact, he was talking about declaring one month sit at home for the Southeast. Let me have your comments on what is really happening in the Southeast. Some people are sympathizing with him uh, as it is, or empathizing, I don't know the word to use, but they are in, in support. There may be few, but others are calling Simon Ekba, for instance, who is now saying that he's stepping into the shoes of Namdi Kanu, a terrorist. What do you think about the actions of someone who is a Nigerian staying somewhere and inciting the people to fight and kill? By law, 
how should he be treated and what should happen in the southeast? Yeah. What is happening in the southeast uh, is uh, very, very unfortunate in so many respects. And I have always said that two wrongs don't make a right. The way a manner, I thought, is going about his campaign is not the right way to go. The way and manner, the federal government and the state governments in the southeast are handling this matter is also not the right way to go. And what is I mean, what EPA? Is it still on EPA or do they call his name? Yes. Who is a Finland? And uh, okay people to stay at home. And probably, or allegedly, getting people to enforce the seat at home order is very, very unfortunate and totally uncalled for. I have said it. It is only in Nigeria that I have seen the so called freedom fighter, like Simon Nepa, like uh, uh, the one who is in detention now, who is in DSS, comforted, and not that who stay abroad and start to throw stones to their fatherland. Go and read the history of liberation struggles around the world, whether it be that of Mandela, whether it be that of Fidel Castro, whether it be that of Nyerere uh, uh, and what have you. They stay within their communities to lead the agitation for independence, for freedom for good governance. So to say, they put the boot on the ground. But for us, yeah, Simeon Nepa and his brother in detention will stay abroad and start ordering people to stay at home, to go and kill and maim, whereas they are in the comfort of their homes abroad. It is unfortunate. And it's totally uncalled for. Um, um, Martin Luther King of America I'm, I'm trying to understand. has shown us the pathway to go. Tunde, just a that you could achieve freedom, you could achieve independence, you could get good governance through protest without embarking on armed struggle. Mm. Let, me, let me just, I'm, I'm worried about, I want to know what the law calls what Simon Ekpa or Simon Ekpa is doing. If he's staying there, he's inciting people to kill as it is now, we know people are being killed, whether he sent them directly or not, but it is because of what he's doing that these people have the opportunity to do this. Is that strong enough to call it terrorism by law or any other name that can be called by law? And if that is the case, why is it difficult for Nigeria to have him brought back to the country? Is it that Finland can do what they like? If you, I will take you back to history of uh, liberation struggles around the world and all that. Most times, when people are agitating for freedom, they are fighting for independence. Especially when they have had an historical and citizen, such as those who are agitating for the Africa have had. Foreign countries or the Western world hardly want to release them to their own countries because they fear that they might be persecuted, because they fear that they might not go get a fair, I mean, a fair trial. And so they want to shield them from persecution. When the Shah of Iran was agitated for change of government in Iran, he lived in France, he stayed in France all the way through. Uh, Fidel Castro went from one Latin America to his country to begin to wage the war of independence in uh, Cuba. You also remember that most of the Southern African uh, liberation fighters who were not in prison with Nelson Mandela were scattered all over the world. And the Western world and African countries didn't want to release them. They to 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 to, to, to the apartheid regime in South Africa. The reason why this is the case, like I said, is that they fear that they might not get a fair uh, uh, trial 
if they get back to their country, that they might be persecuted and that um, they may even be executed. And some of these countries, death penalty has ceased to be a form of punishment administered uh, by the state. For the Nigerian government, in my humble opinion, we owe some responsibility for what is happening in the Southeast. The problem in the Southeast can be easily resolved by organizing a referendum as regards the direction in which the people of the Southeast wants to go. Because if a problem has persisted for more than 40, 50 years and all that, and if I refuse to go, the logical thing for us to do as a people is to organize a referendum in the Southeast, and then those who want the Southeast to succeed will campaign for the secession. The federal government will also campaign for the Southeast to, to, to remain in Nigeria. And whoever wins at the referendum, automatically they will settle the issue in the South. But, but the today, violence that we see in the South, the bloodshed that we are seeing from both sides, either initiated by IPOP or being recruited by the federal government, will not solve this problem. The value of freedom has been so just, just a moment. In the just, just a moment. And the best way to resolve it is through dialogue and referendum. Uh, let, let me just ask, has it, in your opinion, reached a point of referendum? Because there are things on the table that have been listed. They say marginalization, that is one of them. And they're giving reasons why they're saying they want to leave. I've not seen, I've not, I'm not seeing it as they just want to leave, whatever it is. But I think they want to leave if these things cannot be addressed. Do you think we have reached that point where we cannot still go to the round table and say, okay, what are these things that you have tabled before us? How can we address it? Are we not at that point? Are we at the point of referendum already? Well, there is uh, two ways. Dialogue cannot be ruled out. But it doesn't appear that uh, the Nigerian state will want to do dialogue on this matter. If they were disposed to dialogue, they would probably have released Namkano since uh, different courts have given an order for his release. In fact, the bill that has given to Namkano and the order for his release by the different courts is a window of opportunity to begin to negotiate with IPO and negotiate with the evil people as regards the direction in which they want to go. But we are not accepting that corridor of dialogue. Furthermore, with regards to referendum, like I said earlier on, the agitation for civilian in the Southeast didn't start today. In fact, the Southeast went to war with Nigeria between 1967 and 1970, a very bloody civil war. Well, there was no victor, no vanquish. But ever since that time, that's why there was no victor, no vanquish. The agitation, the restlessness, the desire to pull the Southeast out of Nigeria and make it an independent state has never died down. It may sometimes uh, be low in tempo, but at other times again, it blows hot. But, but what do you so think about the airport of a new problem. development? It's a problem that has started in 19, before 1967. If the problem has lasted this long, I should think Just a we, moment. that the problem is right. To the, we are the thing is, how do you assess the efforts by the Nigerian state to even address the problems? No victor, no vanquish, like you have said. But has Nigeria deliberately brought out a policy or made the move to address these issues? Because the healing has not been done. And it's this healing that we need. So describe for me what you think about the effort of the Nigerian state to bring about this healing to the uh, southeast. You saw what happened in the last election, how they were branded. You saw what happens everywhere. Some people feel that they are not people to be trusted. And we just need orientation. But has Nigeria really done something deliberate enough to address this issue? 
Hello? Hello? Mm. I didn't quite get that question. Mm. Has Nigeria, okay, how do you assess the effort of Nigeria as a country to address the problems that have lingered, like you said, for over 40 years, the agitation for an independent country out of the Southeast? Do you rate it high or low? Well, the Nigerian state is not addressing that problem. They think that they can use force to exactly. stamp out the Biafra, to stop the agitation in the Southeast. So if you start a civil war, and after the civil war, the agitation refuses to die down, and there is no proliferation of organizations and uh, militant groups Massop, IPOP, and the uh, movement for the state of Biafra, Biafra, Zionist movements, and what have you. That should tell us that the use of violence is never likely to address that uh, problem. But um, like most states, like most governments all over the world, they hardly want to hear a situation. They hardly want to see a situation in which any part of the country will want to secede or break away. Look at what happened recently in Ethiopia. Ethiopia went to war because the Tigray region or thereabout were clamoring and agitating for independence. They want to secede. Remember when Eritrea also wanted to secede from Ethiopia, the people went to war. At the end of the day, they ended up on the dialogue table and a rich uh, and independence. It is in the nature of most government, almost states around the world, not to want to concede independence to any unit of his of his territory wanting to be independent. But the reality is that uh, when people are determined, when people have resolved, when people want to get their independence, there is hardly any way you can stop them. Sooner than later, they will get the independence. It may be costly, it may be bloody, it may be very, very expensive. But the reality is that uh, you cannot subjugate a people who are clamoring and who are determined to be independent. You can't stop them from marching to an independent uh, state. So Nigeria should learn from history mm. and then they uh, do the right thing. Okay. But let me say this. Mm. When you look at the body language of most people from the Southeast, it is not impossible that if Nigeria goes into a referendum, majority of people in the Southeast might want to remain in Nigeria because Nigeria is a bigger stage in which their talents will be better displayed, in which the people of the Southeast can easily realize their ambition, either in the area of business, in the area of a commerce, neither in the area of writing. Check around the world. Most of the tiny states, most of the small, small states around the world, they are not making impact globally. It is the big countries around the world, like China, like USA, like Russia, India, and what have you, that can go to the moon, that can explore the depth of the ocean, that can embark on gigantic uh, scientific research and get good results from it. So if the South is take cognizance of that, I am sure most reasonable people among them or in the South East would like to remain in Nigeria. So okay. let the Nigerian government do the right thing. Okay. Organize a referendum in the South East and whoever wins should get uh, whatever it is asked. Yeah. Okay. But if the referendum is done and Nigeria wins and the problems continue, is, that will just be another extension of the problems of Biafra uh, coming to play. But let's move to another thing before our time finally finishes on this segment. Um, what is happening in the National Assembly, uh, especially as regards the uh, screening of um, ministerial or screening of the uh, nominees, ministerial nominees, uh, that's the word. Okay, so we've seen what's been happening. We hear today on the punch, there's a, a story that um, 
Today, there's going to be another list that will be sent to the National Assembly. Remember that the president sent a list to beat the deadline, and because he beat the deadline, any other list that comes uh, behind, uh, he's still safe. So he's going to send another list. But what is happening in the National Assembly is what beats a lot of Nigerians hollow. We don't understand what is happening. Uh, the Senate has shielded Erufai from petition over insecurity in Kaduna and so many other people of their ilk, uh, so to speak, are being shielded. Some of them are just taking a bow, even though we know that in their states, they have done very, very badly. But, well, that will be my own measuring, measuring rod, my own ruler, my own uh, yardstick to measure their performance, or the Nigerian yardstick to measure their performance. I don't know if the performance is measured differently by those in political power. But now, here's the thing. Another list is coming. We've seen what is happening. Uh, somebody went to the Senate with some papers, and he didn't even qualify to be there. But before he got nominated to be a minister, he must have served in so many capacities in Nigeria, uh, doing one thing or the other, and nobody ever, ever thought about it. Now it is coming out. People who are not qualified are being nominated to go and become ministers, to superintend over activities that will impact on our lives, and then people who have maybe uh, questionable characters are being shielded by the same Senate that is supposed to screen them. So let me hear your thoughts of what is happening in the National Assembly or what has just happened in the screening of the ministerial nominees. Well, you know, my, it's, what is happening in the National Assembly is very, very unfortunate. Let me begin first and foremost to say that um, with the two lists and all that, or with all the people that might be getting appointed as uh, ministers, we might still be having a very, very big government, a jumbo and amateur of ministers. And if we have been talking about the cost of governance and the need to reduce the cost of governance, one of the things we should do is to reduce the number of ministers and mass some of the ministries that we presently have. But that cannot be done because of the contents of the provisions of the constitution, which prescribes that at least ministers must come from uh, each of the states of, um, of the Federation. And you also know, like I earlier on said, that we have a certain number of ministries that must be, that must be manned by ministers. So with that as it may, uh, the second area I want to address is that um, the way I manage the, the Senate is conducting the screen is very, very unfortunate. It is not different from what we used to have or what we had in the past. And we people just walk into the national to the Senate chamber, take a bow, and then they get appointed, uh, I mean, they get confirmed as, um, as a minister. If you have watched screening in the U.S. Senate, you will agree with me that um, what is happening in the Senate today is a caricature, a kind of charade, a charade of a screening process. In a place like the U.S., the legislators would have uh, done his homework, getting your data, your biography, your history, right from the day you were born, the places you have lived, the schools you have attended, the work that you have done, the number of girlfriends you have, the number of male friends, <clears throat> indictments, if there were, triumph and successes. And they will put this on the table and use this to grill you when they are conducting the screening. Nobody just asks you to take a bar and go away. They will also grill you as regards what improvement you might want to bring into governance. We haven't seen all these things happening in the Senate with regards to the present screening that is going on over there. When you ask somebody to take a bar, you are assuming that it's perfect, that it's an expert, that uh, it's not uh, fallible, that uh, it could do the job. Well, that might not be the case. Most of the people who are being screened today have had one political office or the other, either as governors, either as ministers, either as chairman of our and corporations and all that. If they have been running successes, 
If all these people have been running successfully, Nigeria will not be in the parallel state in which it is today. The country is virtually bankrupt, the economy is down, agriculture is down, security is nothing to write home about, uh, transportation is comatose. And these are people who have been shared with the responsibility of ensuring that the Nigerian state, the Nigerian environment, the Nigerian government, the Nigerian people have good dividends of democracy. So, when such people come to the National Assembly or to the Senate, and you don't greet them as regards their performances in the other sectors in which they have been, in which they have been, um, aired or emptsmen, or in which they have been responsible as governors, ministers, and what have you, then you are not helping Nigeria as a society. Mm. Furthermore, they do not assign the portfolios to people when they are appearing before the Senate. Is also not the best at all because the Senate would have been able to ask these people questions based on the portfolio they are assigned. Yeah. If a man is going to head the health ministry, you might be able to ask him, how is he going to prove improvement into the comatose health sector of the Nigerian, uh, in Nigeria? How many number of hospitals you want to, to, to build? How is he going to stop the brain drain of the medical experts in society? How is he going to bring an improvement to all the medical schools and what have you? How is he going to ensure that drugs are produced in Nigeria instead of being imported from China, instead of being imported from Malaysia, instead of being imported from Pakistan and India? But because portfolios are not assigned to the people appearing before the Senate, you have to like ask them very sensible questions as regards the value they be bringing to the ministry, which they will be heading eventually when the president assigns them their portfolio. So, well. the standards as it is today, if not the entire National Assembly, might just be another rubber stamp that we have had since the return to democracy in 1999. And it's going to, that's going to be a tragedy. It shouldn't be business as usual with the problem that we have in our hands. The workers are presently on the street. And you want to continue to conduct government, government business sure. the way you have been doing it in 1999. Okay. When workers on the street, when okay. the economy is shut down, when school fees have been increased from one university, polytechnic, to secondary school and the other. Okay. For God's sake, this is okay. not the direction in which to go. It's not the direction we want to go at all. But we do hope that something good will come up in the following days because, um, well... Uh, let me leave it at that. Before I let you go, let me just, uh, in Nature News, we have this headline. I'm not asking you to respond anyway, but let me just let the people know. Uh, research says heat waves pose threat to women globally. In Nature News, uh, that's what we have. So you might want to read up on that if you're watching us right now. How does it uh, pose a threat to women globally? Federal government has launched a bull initiative to support 60,000 farmers to boost agricultural productivity and all that. And then Electricity Commission shares energy tips to help consumers reduce bills. There are so many other headlines also on Nature News that you might want to read them up because they are very important to you. Energy, you want to reduce it. Uh, how are you going to be part of these 60,000 uh, farmers that uh, will be given uh, some uh, support? And then how does the heat wave pose a threat to women globally. We've been talking mm -hmm. with... With um, kidnappers and bandits allow farmers to operate. Oh, that's another thing. Anyway, we've been talking with Tunde Kolawole. Tunde Kolawole is a legal practitioner here in Lagos State. Thank you so much for being a part of this show. This Thanks show. for having me, my brother. Yeah. Have a lovely day. You too. So Thank as you. We, as we wrapped up with uh, Tunde, he asked a question. Will, will the bandits and kidnappers allow the farmers to, to even go to the farms? So while the federal government is thinking about giving money to farmers to go to the farm, even if it is in billions, if there is no security, it will only mean that this money will go back to the, um, to the kidnappers and bandits who will now capture them, get this money, and then will still be in the kind of crisis that we are right now. We'll take a short break. And when we return, we'll be talking with another guest. Stay with us.